Hello, this is Team Science, a podcast brought to you by Nature Careers in partnership with Nature Index. I'm Simon Baker, Chief Editor at Nature Index, which tracks research articles in leading science journals. In this series, we explore behind the scenes of academia and speak to the people who make it all possible, but do not necessarily get the credit. This series is sponsored by Western Sydney University. And at the end of this episode, we'll hear about how it is helping to champion team science. In episode three, we delve further into research management and discover how it's done differently around the world. Uh, Yeah, hi. So uh, my name is Simon Kerridge um, and I guess I would call myself a a research manager and administrator um, uh, and RMA. Um, I'm currently a a freelance consultant uh, in a huge company of one, so that's uh, Kerridge Research Consulting, uh, should you be interested. Um, Prior to that, uh, I was uh, Director of Research Services at the University of Kent and have had various other roles before that um, in research management, so I'm a, a veteran of 30 years. ARMA, the Association of Research Managers and Administrators. Um, so I joined in in 1997 as a member, and um, I put myself forward for the um, uh, to join the the committee. Uh, it was the uh, the committee then, rather than the the board, because it wasn't it wasn't a formal association. Um, uh, so that was in 2000. Um, I served for 12 years on the committee till 2012, uh, ha- had a year off and then went back as chair um, for, for three years from uh, 2013-2016. The research culture survey done done through uh, through Armour by, by Hilary Noon was, uh, was, was a very interesting piece of work and certainly a lot in there resonated with me. Um, so yes, the professional research managers and administrators are generally seen to be an invisible profession. Um, so we're a bit like the oil in the cogs. Um, uh, if we're not there, then things go wrong um, and things don't happen as well. But if we're there doing a good job, it's quite easy to kind of you know, miss out, um, certainly if you're, if you're sort of uh, higher up in, um, in the echelons. Particular researchers will work with the research officer, with the research managers, administrators, or their local research manager administrators working in the department, and really appreciate the work that they do on putting a proposal together. That's probably the the most common example is, is working on a, on a on a project proposal, um, and very often they'll be hugely appreciative of, of that. You know, you might even get a, a bottle of wine or a box of chocolates when the submission goes in, uh, or more likely if it gets funded. Uh, but you know, sometimes both. Um, it, but for other people who do not directly um, work with the research managers administrators, um, it, it's kind of well, I'm not quite sure you know, what what they do. Um, their their perception is probably that the researcher puts the proposal together and submits it. Um, and what does the research manager administrator do? Do, do they somehow add some value? I don't see how they possibly could. Um, and so uh, for for those research managers and administrators who, who are in institutions perhaps where research is not the top thing, so maybe teaching intensive institutions uh, or even a lot of uh, sort of you know, sort of mid-ranked institutions, um, they are probably not going to be seen or known by more than 20% of the academic staff. And so the other 80% of the academic staff, who are the ones you know, who are on all the committees for voting for things, for pay rises or whatever it might be, um, it's going to be, well, yeah, I don't really know what they do, but I can see that they cost the university a lot of money because you can see the budget is a source for the research office. And so so where is that where is that added value? So, so I think there is... Um, a big sort of selling job um, that 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 RMAs need to do in order to, in order to show their worth. Um, obviously, it's a service profession, but uh, we have to be careful not to be um, subservient. Uh, so um, there are certain academics who I've worked with, or who have worked with members of my team, um, who have been, shall we say, well, I mean, I guess I'll say it, have been outright bullying. Um, so you know, we have a deadline coming up, um, which they have known about for weeks, not bothered interfacing uh, with, with the research office, and then you know, demand that support. Yeah, I need it signing off. Um, the assumption being that 
you know, people in the research office aren't doing anything else, authority there at their beck and call. Um, yes, it's five to five, but it's okay because you know, I know that you'll work till eight o'clock because the deadline's coming up. Um, so, the, you know, the, there have been not a few instances uh, of that and you can understand why because the academics themselves of course are under a lot of pressure lots of funding probably they couldn't do it the previous week because they were teaching or you know, whatever it might be um, but you know there are certain individuals um, you know for whom you know they are very driven assume everyone else is very driven and want that support and want it now um, but the majority are perfectly fine they understand that we are we're people we have other roles um and they will give us as much notice as possible um and you know okay yes you know, sometimes you know, a late thing does come in um but you know there are different ways of of dealing with it you know, rather than than shouting down the phone have you looked at my proposal yet um so uh I, I guess the system provides um, a lot of pressure um, and because we put a lot of emphasis, we, um, uh, the, the sector, on on research income, um, then, you know, uh, it, anything that uh, an academic can do to try and increase their research income by getting those extra proposals in on time is going to be something which they think is, is going to help them with their career. Um, so there is a very much a, 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 you know, a huge power dynamic there, uh, and, and that can be problematic. Research management administration probably been around for over 100 years, but only really for about 65 years or so um, in actuality in terms of association. So in the US, yeah, it's been around for a long time. I mean, I, I, I know of some second generation um, research administrators on I wonder if there's any third generation ones could be by now but yeah so some people whose you know uh, parent or parents were and so they actually saw it as something that um, th- that they would want to to move into so uh, so yes um, I, I guess the difference in the US uh, and also also Canada um, is that it is now very much seen as a uh, as a profession as opposed to something which you would maybe fall into sideways from uh, from being a researcher which is very common uh, in the uk europe um, africa uh, in fact everywhere um, uh, for example it's much more common for um, a u.s research administrator to um, to have a master's rather than a phd um, whereas uh, it's uh, a lot higher sort of 30 40 even 50 percent in in some countries of, of research managers administrators having phds because they have previously been researchers I am Tadashi Sugihara, uh, working in Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University in Japan. I am the manager of the Grants and Research Collaboration section and have served for about six years. Uh, my dream was to live uh, as a scientist. So I tried to become an independent researcher uh, in brain science. But uh, in short, unfortunately, I was not good enough. And finding a job in any company was uh, very challenging uh, because my uh, ex- expertise uh, was probably too specific and narrow. And while I was leading a joint project uh, with a big company in Japan, I gradually learned that I am okay with writing reports and uh, uh, negotiations with a company. These tasks some researchers do not like or are not good at. Then the Japanese government started a research administration project and encouraged the universities in Japan to implement a research administration system. I applied for a position at Kyoto University and I got the job. That's the beginning of my new career in my life. I think there are many research administrators in the United States who do not have a PhD, but their support is very fantastic. But in Japan, the Japanese government started a project uh, which encouraged uh, the Japanese universities to implement this uh, administration system. In, in that context, Japanese government considers that 
uh, PhD holders uh, will be uh, the core of the people who can become uh, research administrators. Because that, that's the beginning of the,、uh, the history of research administrators in Japan. So,、uh, in general, uh, if, PH,、uh, if uh, one has the PhD degree, uh, uh, research community in Japan uh, may uh, welcome such people and、uh, listen to、uh, such people's advice. My name is Alain Mohona. I was a research manager at the Infectious Diseases Institute、uh, of Makere University in Uganda、uh, for about seven years. And、uh, my job、uh, involved everything research. So、uh, it involved the, the pre award proce- process, which、uh, is looking for funding. Uh, connecting with the funders, applying for the funding, all the way through to close out、uh, of, the, of the research project.、Um, and in between,、uh, during the, the post award, but uh, uh, for research implementation, I was involved in、um, recruitment of staff for the project, for the research project. I was also involved in the ethical review of the, of the research, or at least the process that led to the ethical review.、Um, I was involved in、um, the budgeting, of course, the,、uh, and、uh, disbursement of funding and、uh, setting up research platforms for,、uh, that we could explore. So,、um, at the moment, I work with the Science for Africa Foundation.、Uh, we are based in Nairobi. I lead the research management program、uh, in Africa called REMPRO Africa.、Uh, so, what we, what we are doing is really trying to address the systemic level、uh, challenges at institutions. So, we are looking at the institutional leadership. We are looking at uh, uh, sustainability of both the research management function but also the research enterprise generally at the institutions. We're looking at、uh, creating standards that then help the research managers use that as a benchmark to improve their, their organizations. And the third is to build capacities of those individuals that support research at all those institutions. I did a Bachelor of Science at university and then、uh, did also a Bachelor of Mass Communication. So I really can't say I was prepared for research management. I stumbled into it by mistake because <laughs> one of my bosses at the time, you know, there was a gap and said we could reskill and upskill this kind of a person to, to take up the position of, of research manager at the organization. Maybe what I should say is that there are no courses on the continent that really teach you how to be a research manager. You kind of stumble into it, and then the biggest Builders of skill in,、uh, in Africa is really the networks and the collaborations. And so at、uh, Infectious Diseases, I was very lucky to have several collaborations like Johns Hopkins University in the US that I went to to kind of understand what do people do actually. And maybe just to say, the Research manager in Africa, in most of the African universities, is a generalist.、Um, for, a la- for lack of a better word, is a generalist. So they do everything. They must understand everything. They must understand the science, the ethics,、uh, the regulatory aspects, the, the, the financials,、uh, people management,、uh, close out, set up of systems. It was a baptism by fire. But- But it was really good for me because、uh, it helped me grow. But it was quite a challenge for several people because when I left the institute,、uh, it was hard to get one person with all the skill sets.
So uh, sometimes uh, we have a hard time to, uh, for example, to, to pre prepare uh, the researchers' applications because they may not uh, really listen to our advice. This happens uh, everywhere, and uh, any uh, interpersonal uh, relationship will start by knowing each other. So uh, as we uh, deepen our conversations, then sometimes they realize that uh, our comments uh, is very reasonable. So gradually, uh, they will trust us to some extent. Then uh, this will, uh, you know, uh, uh, make both of, of us uh, happier. And in the future, uh, they are uh, very good customers uh, for, for our office. They often just uh, come by, uh, dro drop by our office if they, they have some questions. So then we think they kindly understand uh, the importance of our function. The, re the, the academics uh, feel that they know everything. Uh, they don't understand why the research manager, this lowly research manager, has the audacity to stop their study, for instance. And many of the, maybe let me just say, the many of the academics are actually uh, professors or senior lecturers uh, in their, and, uh, you know, uh, accomplished in their fields. And so they feel that uh, research managers and administrators are adding extra layers of, of, uh, of bureaucracy to their research, um, but also feel that uh, because you're not a professor, you have no business telling the professor how to do their research because they've been doing research way before you joined the profession. So they don't, under they don't understand how you then come to, ex to tell them that there are certain regulatory aspects you must follow. There's, there's, certain, uh, there's a certain way in uh, the university or institution must um, apply for funding and ensure, that the inst ensure the continuity of the institution beyond your grant. Uh, and also build the institution for the next generation of researchers. Uh, so um, this has changed over time, but very slowly, and many institutions are still struggling really to allocate resources for research management and understand that uh, research management is actually um, a main component, not just a small component, but a main component of, of uh, research at any institution and therefore it should be resourced with um, both human uh, and financial resources so that they are able to grow the portfolio of the institution uh, because they are supporting the, re the, the researchers in those institutions. Um, I think eventually researchers uh, are beginning to appreciate uh, the role of the research manager um, very slowly, but there's incremental change because then they realize for you to navigate all those security offices, to navigate the regulatory bodies, to navigate uh, the budgeting office and all that, you need a cadre of professionals to, to do that for you. And those are the research managers and administrators. And so the, the appreciation is very slowly growing, um, more developed in some places than others uh, but yeah uh, at the start that wasn't always the case. But uh, I believe that uh, there's no special skills but uh, in general the skill for a business person is necessary. Writing clearly and uh, negotiation skill, logical reasoning, uh, presentation, and some analytical skill, and so on. But the uh, important is a uh, customer-oriented mind. In our case, a uh, researcher-oriented mind. 
For this reason, reason、uh, research experience would be a good、uh, asset.、Uh, we've partnered with AMA UK to build a program called the International Research Management Staff Development Program. We've had our first cohort of participants where we had research managers from the UK universities. Partnered with the research managers from different African universities to create international teams that then create innovations in research management. But importantly, it was to understand the different cultural perspectives at the African universities versus the UK universities, and then build collaborations and networks for the research managers. Because if you're dealing with someone at an institution whom you've dealt with previously, Uh, then it's easy for you to reach out to them and say, I have a problem, I have a challenge here. How do we overcome this challenge and make our, you know, whether it's the contracting or, or implementation of research, how do we make that move forward? So that, that was a very successful program. And I, I should emphasize that、uh, we are working with the University leadership through their different fora, vice chancellors and deputy vice chancellors, because we recognize that if the leadership is not、uh, well informed and、uh, does not appreciate the function of research management, then they will not、uh, create the pathways for growth for research managers. And so that's the work that I'm currently doing, and it's very exciting because I really、uh, pulled from my own experiences starting、uh, way back and what I had to go through to grow through the profession and、uh, I mean, upscaling for myself so that I can be both strategic and administrative、uh, at the same time. because That's what research management is about. It's not just the mundane administrative aspects, it's also the strategic aspects around advising where to invest, how to invest, creating a portfolio of、uh, competences for the institution, and actually uh, uh, you know, broadcasting those for, to attract funding, but also to look at、uh, a range of funders. And create、uh, collaborations that are equitable、uh, for the institution and for the researcher. And, and of course, there are some people who kind of live between those two worlds, if you like, who, who have an academic or a research role and also have a research management or research management administration role. So, when I was thinking about my,、uh, myself、um, when I was in the early 90s, I was a, a researcher on a European project, but I was also doing research management duties, and that gave me the skills to become a, a research manager.、Um, that's very common、um, in institutions where、um, research is new or growing. Or In countries where research is, is new or growing, where researchers themselves often have to do research management、uh, duties,、um, and then eventually、uh, research management resources is, is, is built up. But、um, during that sort of、um, interim phase,、um, there are quite often people who have those same roles, and so one day, Or one hour they're a researcher, and the next hour they're a research manager,、um, not just on their own project, but you know, helping or advising other people. So it's very much that sort of moving、um, in, that, in that third space, as Celia Whitchurch calls it,、uh, between、um, academia and management or academia and, and leadership. So, I guess the thing that we can learn、uh, from, from America is that sort of professionalization, if you like.、Um, there are you know, these, these large councils,、um, the, um, the research administrators in, in the US are. Part of the larger research ecosystem. So I think we're getting there in the UK、um, and, and a little bit in, in Europe in terms of、um, the research managers and administrators being seen as a resource for 
for funders, uh, for, for, for government bodies, for, for policy makers, for will this thing actually work? Is there a better way of doing it? Um, because more often than not, we're the people who will actually be running and using those systems um, and have experience of submitting hundreds of proposals uh, as opposed to your standard sort of a member of academic staff who's probably going to submit two or three proposals a year or even if it's ten, it's not going to be as many as a research manager administrator. So it's, it's kind of getting people to recognise the experience and expertise that we have. So, so there, are, there are different models from, uh, from, from different countries. I think there are many jobs uh, even in Japan and in the world but uh, uh, sometimes I think uh, there are not many jobs uh, in which uh, we can really uh, receive a very kind uh, messages uh, from customers and uh, in our case uh, the customers are mostly researchers and so uh, I think uh, this research administration, uh, administration job is a very unique and a very precious job uh, which uh, makes uh, us very happy. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Team Science Podcast. I'm Simon Baker, Chief Editor at Nature Index. The producer was Don Byrne. Next up, we'll hear how Western Sydney University, the sponsor of this series, is helping to champion team science. I'm Karis Bazaka and welcome to this podcast series from Western Sydney University. Over this six-episode series, I'll be introducing you to some incredible research taking place from a million-dollar fungi project that's helping combat climate change to surveys into maternity care treatment to creating electric vehicles for women in rural African communities and more. These projects are just a handful of those that entered the 2022 and 2023 Research Impact Competition run by Western Sydney University in Australia. There's also something else they have in common. They each speak to a Sustainable Development Goal, or SDG, a list of 17 goals created by the United Nations which tackle global issues including poverty, hunger, climate change, gender inequality and access to education. So how do we identify problems and then the path forward? Well, through research. And this research is happening at universities across the globe, who are graded in the annual Times Higher Education Impact Rankings on their commitment to the SDGs. This is significant because out of 1,700 universities in the world, Western Sydney University ranked number one overall for the past two years. And if we drill down into the SDGs it excelled in, it came first for the goals Gender Equality, Partnership for the Goals and Responsible Consumption and Production. For more information about sustainable development goals, you can visit sdgs.un.org and keep listening as the researchers across this series will talk to how their projects contribute to positive change. Before we dive in, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the custodians of the lands where Western Sydney University campuses are located and pay respect to the peoples of the Darug, Tharawal, Eora and Wiradjuri nations. I pay my respect to elders past and present. Always was, always will be. Now let's hear from some of the researchers from Western Sydney University's Research Impact Competition. I am a former high school science teacher myself and of course I'm really passionate about particularly getting more girls into STEM fields where they're underrepresented. That's Dr Erin McKenzie, who works at Western Sydney University School of Education as a Senior Lecturer in Educational Psychology and STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Math. Dr McKenzie took part in the 2022 Research Impact Competition for her project, which investigates attitudes towards science study for girls and boys in their early to middle years of high school, as well as their thoughts on continuing with science into Year 11 and 12. What we're trying to do 
is see if there are particular attitudes that we might be able to support teachers to intervene in to then increase participation in science in the senior years of high school. The thinking behind it is that if we can support girls and boys to have more positive attitudes towards science, then we're more likely to get more kids engaged in year 11 and 12, and then hopefully that will have flow on effects into tertiary study and careers in STEM more broadly. The underrepresentation of women in STEM is often referred to as the leaky pipeline. The leaky pipeline is a metaphor. It's not a perfect one, but it's a metaphor that just recognises that there are multiple points along a woman's life in which she might start to disengage and opt out of science or STEM more broadly. And so we're focusing on high school as being just one of those places along the leaky pipeline where we lose students. Because it's actually really difficult if a student has decided that they're not going to study any science or mathematics. If they've made that decision in high school, it becomes really difficult for them to then opt back in when they move into tertiary study. And then obviously that has flow on effects in terms of the sorts of careers that they can pursue. And we know that despite really extensive research attention and focus from government policy and from industry, we still know that women are really quite severely underrepresented in many of the STEM fields. For context, in Australia, science is mandatory for students in New South Wales until year 10, and a previous study into participation in science subjects in year 11 showed that while there was an over-representation of girls studying biology, there was an under-representation in chemistry and a significant under-representation in physics. Data from the New South Wales Education Standards Authority showed that in 2022, across the state, just 4.9% of girls in year 12 that were awarded a higher school certificate chose to study physics. So I suppose for us, it's about trying to fix a gap in the pipeline that's a fairly early one in the early years of high school. That starts with research, which Dr McKenzie has been leading for the past three years. We've worked with just under a 1,000 students across about seven different schools, and the research has been predominantly survey-based, so the students complete a survey about their attitudes, but they also include what they're planning to do for their career and also which subjects they're planning to take in Year 11 and Year 12. And so some of the really interesting findings for us have been that The kids who have higher levels of anxiety around learning maths are less likely to want to continue studying subjects like chemistry and physics that are quite mathematically oriented as well. So that's really important in terms of opening up conversations about how attitudes in, say, mathematics are then having a flow and effect into some of the sciences. And then another really key finding has also been that the most important factor that seems to predict whether kids are intending to continue studying any of the sciences has been whether they think that science is relevant either to their current lives or to their future career. Dr McKenzie has been working with teachers to think about ways of making the link between science study and its use outside the classroom much clearer, which does create its own hurdles. It's always challenging for schools to fit anything additional into their days. So we're very conscious of asking schools to give us access to their school day and to their students. But I think we're trying to give teachers a really clear way forward. This is what the data from your students is saying. So then what does that mean in terms of really practical implications for teachers to then make small changes to their practice to try and support kids to stay in science as they move through high school. And recent years have indicated just how important that understanding of science is. Coming out of COVID, we have really been shown how important it is that kids have a high level of scientific literacy so that they are able to critically analyse the information that's in front of them so that they understand basic science and can engage with research in terms of making health decisions for their future. Kids are being constantly bombarded with misinformation online through social media. And so I think it's 
arguably we're at a really important time where kids, girls and boys, really, really need to stay engaged in science so that they can identify that misinformation and and make really educated decisions for their future. Dr McKenzie's research also ties in with the SDGs. This work definitely aligns with quality education as a sustainable development goal, but it also underpins work in terms of addressing gender equality. Going forward, Dr McKenzie wants to build upon their findings around the link between maths anxiety and its potential impact on chemistry and physics enrolments. So our future work, I think, will focus on that interplay between attitudes in maths and science. So while we've looked at it from a negative point of view around maths anxiety, indicating that that might lead students to opt out of some sciences, the flip side, I suppose, is that science provides a really nice way of showing kids how maths can be applied in their everyday life. We do teach them in a fairly siloed way in high school. So there's potentially ways that we can get maths and science teachers working together to show kids where the links are between the two subjects, because that's how they operate in the real world. So that's one of our sort of key directions going forward is to expand the study, I suppose, out from focusing just on science, but to integrate attitudes towards maths as well. That was Dr Erin McKenzie, one of the participants in the 2022 Research Impact Competition at Western Sydney University. Join us for the next episode to find out more about the research being undertaken in Australia and its real-world impact, both now and into the future.